Mr. Spence, if you'd call your first witness. <clears throat> call Bill Newman, please. You've been sworn? Yes, sir. If you would, please have a seat right over here, Mr. Newman. Mr. Newman, this is the jury over here. Say hello to the folks. Hello. Tell them who you are. My name is W.E. Newman. Where do you live, Bill? I live in Mesquite, Texas. Do you remember the fateful day when our president was killed? Yes, sir, I certainly do. Were you there? Yes, sir. Where were you? I was standing on the uh, curb uh, <clears throat> in front of the grassy knoll. Uh, my wife and myself were the last group of people uh, along the curb. Do you see the grassy knoll here where you were? Yes, sir. Could you just take this blue pen and mark where you were with your wife and children? I believe we were in this area right here. Thank you. Could we have the Zapruder film, the enhanced version uh, at the regular speed. Now, just tell the jury in your own words what happened. Uh, well, sir, we were standing along the uh, curb on Elm Street, and as the president's car come towards us, probably 200 feet or so from us, uh, we heard a Boom, boom, like that. President sort of throwed his arms up, and we thought at that time maybe someone had thrown uh, firecrackers or something beside the uh, president's car. Uh, as the president's car came closer to us, uh, we could see that something was wrong, that uh, Governor Con Conley, uh, I could see the blood on his shirt and Go Governor Conley's uh, eyes protruding, and the president, was looking into the uh, crowd of people. He was moving his head about and looking into the crowd of the people. And just as the president's car got directly in front of me, and the president was probably 15 feet away, boom, and the side of his ear flew off and just uh, bits and pieces flew off. Uh, I can remember seeing just a white flash and then the red, and the president fell across the car uh, as if you'd hit him with a bat. He fell across the car and back into Mrs. Kennedy's lap. Uh, I turned to, uh, I remember her saying, oh my God, they've shot Jack. Who was her? Mrs. Kennedy. And uh, then- you, could, you were that close, you could hear it. Yes, sir, I was uh, uh, as close as from where you're standing to myself, uh, from the president when the third shot was fired. Uh, at that time, I turned to Gail and I said, that's it, hit the ground. And uh, we hit the ground uh, because we thought we were in direct uh, line of fire at that time. Where did you think the shots were coming from? Uh, sir, I thought the shots were coming from directly behind. And where would that be on this exhibit? Uh, it would be somewhere back in this general area. All right. Now. Did after you uh, you hit the ground you covered your children? Yes. Do we have a photograph that reveals that. Uh, exhibit uh, 201, please. Do you recognize Exhibit 201? Yes, sir. I recognize the uh, picture. And are you there? Yes, sir. Let's have the next exhibit, which I believe is 202. Is that you, sir? Yes, sir. And that's your baby. Yes, sir. How big is that boy now? <laughs> Well, he's in Texas Tech University. He's, uh, uh, now the, I may be under oath, but he, I, I think he's 26 years old. <laughs> you may examine. Let the record reflect you don't have to be 26 to go to Tech, so. Uh, okay. Mr. Newman, you believe the shot to the president's head was the last shot, is that correct, sir? Yes, sir, I do. Now, I take it, Mr. Newman, that there was a lot of panic and confusion after the shooting, is that correct? Yes, sir. People were running around, it was yes, almost sir. mass hysteria, is that correct? Yes, sir. And even at the time of the shooting, you were uh, in fear for your own life and your family's life, is that correct? 
after the third shot was fire yet fired yes okay. sir. had you ever before been in the presence of the president of the united states no sir okay was this a, an exciting moment for you yeah, yes sir it was do you think mr newman that um, in view of the fact that the president of the united states perhaps the most powerful man in the free world was driving right by you and in view of the fact that he was horribly murdered right in front of your eyes and with all the panic and the confusion and the fact that you yourself at least during one of the the shots was in fear for your own life and your family's life is it possible that you could accurately perceive under all of those circumstances what you thought you saw heard well sir i, I saw what i saw and i don't know how uh, how to answer your question uh, well uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure there's room for doubt in, in anybody's mind All right. Mr. Newman you have learned since the assassination that other things that you thought you saw and heard turned out to be not true even though you thought you saw them with your very own eyes isn't that correct G give me an example sir all right I'll give you an example this is Decker exhibit number 5323. You've heard of Sheriff Decker from Dallas County? Yes, sir. Now, you gave him a statement. They typed it up and you signed your name. You recognize your signature there, do you not? Yes, sir. Okay. You gave him a statement on November the 22nd, 1963. I'll read a portion of it. We were standing at the edge of the curb looking at the car as it was coming towards us and all of a sudden there was a noise apparently gunshot the president jumped up in his seat and it looked like what i thought was a firecracker had went off and i thought he had reala realized that it was just like an explosion and he was standing up did you sign your name to that document i signed my name to that document. Uh, you're aware that president kennedy never stood up in the presidential limousine is that correct yes sir thank you mr newman no further questions Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you want to, do you want to tell the folks? Just a minute, if you don't mind, he would appreciate it if you'd stand up and ask yes, your question. Yes. Thank you. Would, you. would you mind telling the folks in the jury what the circumstances were of you having written that document about the president standing up? The part about the president standing up, the president did come up in his seat. And, of course, uh, <clears throat> at that time, I was pretty upset and excited myself, and I may have uh, said the president stood up when all he in reality did was throw his arms up. Uh, that's, that's all. That's Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you, you, you may step down. Party next witness. Uh, Tom Tilson, please. Tilson, please. Mr. Tilson, if you would, please, you'd come forward. Well, Mr. Tilson, how are you? Fine. Just, just, just give come, me your hat. Just, just put that right. Mr. Tilson, if you would, please, if you'd come up here and have a seat. Good to see somebody. Have you been sworn us. as yes. a witness? All right, fine. All right. Tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury who you are. I'm Tom Tilson, Dallas Police Department, Dallas, Texas, USA. Mr. Tilson, um, were you around uh, Dallas uh, when our president was assassinated? Yes, sir. Uh, one of the things that uh, I'd like to know is whether you knew a character by the name of Ruby. That is, a fellow by the name of Jack Ruby. I did. How did you happen to know him? He had a... Uh, Silver Spur dance hall on my beat. How long had you known who Ruby was and what he looked like? Oh, about 1956. The cat assassination was in 63? Yes, sir. So plenty of time, right? Correct. Are you trained to identify people? Yes. That's part of your training? Part of it. And uh, so on the date of the assassination of our president, where were you? I was at the scene, just on the west side of the triple underpass. And um, could, you, could you tell us about where you were um, on this exhibit? Do you recognize it? Is this, too, is this easy enough to, to locate yourself on? Well, no, I, I can get up and show you. Please do that. Where I was, not quite on the map, I was right over here. 
This is the railroad track, and this is grass to know. Just like Elm Street. How about using this? Would it help you a little, Tom, if we gave you uh, an aerial photograph? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I like this to be on the map, you know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's a little bit better. Yeah. I was just about here, going in. I was back up there when I heard out of police radio on my car. And I heard that come out the president had just been shot up here. And so and naturally I knew where I was and he had to come this way. My daughter and I, I had a daughter out of college at home for the holidays. She was in the car with me. Okay, right about here, right about here, I saw the president's car coming this way. And he had the Secret Service and all just laying over everybody in the car. And by that time I'd on down about here. And right Right here, there's a sign here. There was a car parked right up. This is the sidewalk. On the other side of the sidewalk, there's a car right here. There's a guy right here, top of this grass knoll at the incline. Right here, the uh, fella right here. And uh, he, was, uh, he came down this grass knoll behind this sign. And, and uh, when he got to the car, he was about the front of the car. Okay, he didn't go around the driver's side. He went to the back window of the car and threw, threw an object into the car. What did the object look like? Well, he had it under his coat and I didn't see it. And he came back to the front of the car and went around the front of the car and got into the driver's side. Then he'd come back off the curb into the street. The president's car had already gone. And he came on over here. This concrete right here gives out because Main Street traffic coming out. Anyway, I went on up this way real fast and caught up with him just at the light turn. And I went on, followed him on the industrial. During this time, I told my daughter to get a pencil and paper out of the car pocket and write the last number down. The license number. The last number of the car, which she did. And uh, when we got up on 30, headed for, towards Fort Worth, I started to pull up by the side of his car. And uh, I said, it's not worth it. Not worth what? Her getting shot. If he had had a gun in the car seat, all he'd have done was shot. And then he'd have struck my daughter or me, or both of us. All right. So I fell back and took the first exit over the river and used the phone and called the number in to homicide. And uh, somebody up there took it down. Now, what happened after you gave the police that number? Did anybody ever call you back? They never contacted me about that at all. Thank you, sir. Now, did you see Jack Ruby on that day? No, sir, I didn't see Jack Ruby on that day. Did you uh, see anybody that looked like Jack Ruby on that day? I did. Where did you see him? I saw him coming down the grass and old getting in that, in that car. In this car that you've been talking about? Yes, sir. You're saying that the man that came down the grassy knoll and got in this car and drove off that you've been describing looked like Jack Ruby? Yes, sir. Exactly like him. Weight and height and same kind of clothes he wore and color hair. Did you, uh, were, you, were, you were you around when uh, uh, Jack Ruby shot my client no sir i wasn't down there i see well give us a picture of of uh of uh, mr ruby that's exhibit 205 how about that? that looks like him is that jack ruby yeah is that the man that you saw that got in that car just like the man dark suit and dark hair and all did he, he have a dark wore, suit on that day he always wore dark suits nearly all the time did he wear a dark, did the man you see that day wear a dark suit? Yes, sir. 
Every time I ever seen him, he had a dark suit on. I'll be darned. Well, thank you, sir. Very much. I appreciate you. Can't tell you how much I appreciate your coming. Thank Will you. you Mr. Tilson, you've had a couple chats over the phone, have we not, sir? Yes, sir. Now, when you pursued this man in your car, you told me that he did not drive fast at all. That's correct. That's right. He okay. didn't. And then, as I understand it, you called Dallas Homicide from a telephone booth and gave them the license plate number. Is that correct? Correct. You told me, did you not, that you thought Dallas Homicide wasn't even interested in the information you gave them, right? Correct. Did you tell me that if you didn't wear a, a, a Stetson hat in Dallas Homicide, they didn't want to talk to you? They didn't even want to come in the office. It was kind of a closed section. Well, Tom, now, the President of the United States had just been assassinated, and you, a Dallas police officer, well-decorated police officer, you called Dallas Homicide, and you tell them that you saw a man running from the scene of the murder and get in a car, and you gave them the license plate number, and you're telling this jury, Tom, that they weren't interested? Well, that's why I realized after I'd called it in, they probably thought just like I did. Who would use a, their own car, an own license number, to kill a president of the United States? Let's talk about Ruby a little more. The man you saw running away. You told me, and I don't take shorthand, but you said, if I had to bet money, I would... I would bet that that man was Jack Ruby. You remember telling me that? Yes, sir. And you knew Ruby pretty well, right? Yes, sir. For the record, Jack Ruby was seen by one witness at 1225 at the Dallas Morning News office, placing his regular weekly advertisement for his nightclubs, and by another witness at 1240 in the same office. Now, you felt that Jack Ruby is the one that killed President Kennedy, right? I couldn't swear to it. But, I mean, you have that feeling. The person I chased and the, from the grassy knoll is the one to kill the president of the United States. Oswald did not kill the president. Okay. He shot the president trying to, but he didn't so, kill the president. So the, the, the fellow that you saw running away, whom you believe to be Jack Ruby, you feel that he's the one that killed the president? He's the killer. Later on TV, you see that Oswald was arrested for the murder of the president, right? Correct. Didn't you say to yourself, hey, they got the wrong guy, they should pick up Jack? No, it, not until Jack shot him. When Jack shot Oswald, I said, now nah, be darned, that's old Ruby, all right. This, this license plate number, Tom, uh, you eventually threw that away, did you not, sir? I kept it for a few years. When my wife died, I cleaned the whole house and everything out and went through all the drawers and, and uh, all of my holy stuff, I'd retire, and I said, I'll never need this last number anymore. But I threw it out in the trash can with a whole bunch of other trash. But it was an historic piece of evidence, and, and certainly the most important murder case ever in this country, and one of the most important murder cases in the history of, of mankind. And, and you had enough room in your home, you didn't have to throw that piece of paper away, did you? No, because I held it in a while and looked at it and thought. I said, well, Homicide didn't care about it, FBI didn't care about it, CIA didn't care about it, and it's been all these years, why keep it? You never once called Dallas Homicide to find out, did you, uh, Tom, whether they had followed up on what you had... No, I, I, I didn't dare go in the office. I didn't have a white hat. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you very much. You may step down. Mr. Spence, call your next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Call... Dr. Vect, please. Dr. Vect? Yes, sir, if you would, please. You, Dr. Vect? Yes, Your Honor. Have you been sworn as a witness? Yes, I have, Fine. Your Honor. Fine, thank you. If you would, please, come forward. Take your seat up here in the jury box. Court, please. You may proceed. Doctor. Tell them who you are. Dr. Cyril Wecht, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm a pathologist specializing in anatomic, clinical, and forensic pathology. Thank you. Would you tell the folks um, whether or not you were part of the president's, of uh, the House Committee's panel? Yes, I was, Mr. Spence, one of the nine forensic pathologists who had been convened by the 
Select Committee of Assassinations uh, by the House of Representatives. And uh, you served with Dr. Petty, who the jury have already heard? Yes. Did you agree with the conclusions that Dr. Petty gave to the jury in this case? No, not with what I would consider to be the principal, relevant, and important issues in this case. All right, now, Doctor, let's get with what the facts are in this case. Why is everybody concerned? Just explain as briefly as you can why everybody's concerned about whether there was one shot that went through both the president and Governor Conley or two shots. I mean, what possible difference does it make? Explain. The reason for the problem was this. They got the alleged murder weapon, this Manneker Carcano single action uh, non-automatic weapon, and it was determined that in the hands of the most skilled marksman that the government could find, it took 2.3 seconds from shot to shot. They then looked at the Zapruder film, and they saw when Kennedy was hit the first time, then when Connolly was hit, and they determined that there was only a lapse of time somewhere between one half to one and a half seconds. So it was then humanly impossible. They had already made the commitment to themselves that it was a sole assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald. They then had to find a way to fit all that in. The way they found was the so-called single bullet theory, which we prefer to refer to as the magic bullet theory. That is the theory that holds that the same bullet that went through the president's back and out his neck, re-entered Connolly's back, went through his chest, broke his rib, exited from the front of his chest, re-entered the back of his wrist, caused a comminuted or shattered fraction of the distal end of the radius, the heavy bent, dense bone that comes from the elbow to the wrist, exited from the front of the wrist, re-entered the left thigh, fell out of the left thigh, was not noticed by anybody until a few hours afterwards at Parkland Hospital when a maintenance man was trying to get to the men's room, found his way blocked by stretchers from the emergency room, moved the stretcher, and lo and behold, there was Commission Exhibit 399, the magic bullet. Without the single bullet theory, there has to be more than one person shooting. I'm not talking about who or what. And without, their, without their believing in the single bullet theory, the time won't work out. Is that it? That's it, exactly. Let's take a look at uh, what's on the board. Explain now what this uh, exhibit shows, Doctor. Yes. This exhibit shows <clears throat> from our left, the juries, President Kennedy and you his wife. stand down. Certainly. May I use this, Your yes, Honor? Please. Step yes, please. Right step on this Don't side. Don't use it on me. Thank you. President and Mrs. Kennedy, Governor Connolly, Mrs. Connolly, these are jump seats in the rear compartment of the car. <coughs> Greer and Kellerman, the Secret Service agents. This is a simple schematic illustration to demonstrate how a bullet would have been moving if it had been fired from the sixth floor window of the Texas School Book Depository building. It would have been coming from up downward it would have been coming from right to left and from rear to front. The bullet <clears throat> entered the back of President Kennedy and then it moved to the front and it moved to the left and it exited from the midline of his neck. That bullet did not strike any dense bone. There was nothing to deflect it whatsoever, nothing to alter its path. It was traveling at approximately 2,000 feet per second muzzle velocity. When it exited from the front of the president's throat, it would have continued in a straight line. There is simply no way possible for that bullet to have entered Governor Connolly's posterior right axillary area, which is a fancy medical way for saying behind the right armpit. If it hit him behind the right armpit, it would have had to have come out of the president's neck and in some way veered back to the right and then stopped and turned around and started once again in a path toward the left. Bullets do not react that way, not even in comic books. <laughs> Folks, show me exhibit 67 again, please. What does it show you, doctor? This is Zapruder frame 230. The president has been hit, both of his arms have come up, 
one toward his mouth, the other toward his throat. Governor Connolly seated directly in front of the president, as you can see. At this point, the president has been hit <clears throat> approximately one to one and a half seconds already, sometime behind the so-called Stemmons Freeway sign. Please note that Governor Connolly is holding a large size white Texas Stetson type hat. No. And notice Please, his let me stop right, a minute. right hand. That's this hat. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. He's holding it in his hand. And he has it clutched between his fingers and his thumb. He's already been hit, supposedly, according to Dr. Petty. Under the single bullet theory, approximately a second to a second and a half has elapsed, and Governor Conley, under the definition of the single bullet theory, has been hit through the chest, through the wrist, the bone has been shattered, the radial nerve that permits the thumb to hold things in apposition has been almost completely severed, the bullet's gone into the left thigh, and there he sits, continuing to hold the hat and to look forward. A remarkable accomplishment. Thank you. Now let's take a look at Exhibit 278. Would you come over here, doctor? We're not getting much uh, exercise anyway here in this trial. What do we got here? Uh, what this shows is a composite of several bullets. Bullets that were fired in an experiment conducted under the auspices and at the direction of the Warren Commission in 1964 at an Army base in Maryland near Washington, D.C. They fired 6.5 millimeter copper jacketed lead core military type ammunition first into cotton wadding, striking nothing. Same as this gun. Same, same ammunition as this, out of exact this Exact same ammunition and from the same kind of weapon. Not Oswald's weapon, but another Mannlicher Carcano. These two bullets were fired into cotton wadding, striking nothing. Notice the deformity at the base. This bullet went through a goat carcass, breaking one rib of a goat. Notice it's widening. It even looks like a different bullet, but it's the same ammunition. That deformity is caused by the impact against one rib of a goat. And notice the extrusion of the lead core at the base. This bullet went through the wrist of a human cadaver, breaking the radius of a human cadaver, the same bone that was broken in Governor Connolly. In other words, they wanted to, to simulate, to reproduce the fractures that had occurred in the governor. So this one was to simulate the rib fracture, and this one was to simulate the wrist fracture. This bullet is not involved in this case. It's the same ammunition not involved in this case. Thank you. Uh, and over here, a little off the screen, is Commission Exhibit 399, the so-called stretcher bullet, which, according to the government's theory, broke both the rib and the wrist in Governor Connolly, but emerged in near pristine condition, the only de slight deformity at the base, otherwise the bullet completely intact. And yet here are the results of their experiment, and they chose the sample or representative bullets. I did not choose them. I'm Thank waving you. my objection to all this, Your Honor. That I understand. Obviously, totally and completely improper. He's given a summation to the jury, but I'm waving the objection. Thank you, Your Honor. Let's well, soon, let's now, soon enjoy himself. Disregard the remark. Let's go. Let me, uh, let me ask you, uh, did you check the autopsy that was, that was produced in this case, the oh. autopsy uh, proceeding, and what, what they did at the autopsy? Yes. What did you find? One of the most uh, incomplete, superficial, inadequate, inept, forensic, pathologically incompetent medical legal autopsies I've ever seen. Explain why. The autopsy, <clears throat> for example, measures the locations of the wounds in relationship to other anatomic landmarks instead of relating them, as we always do, to the top of the head and the midline of the body. The, um, Brain subsequently was not fully examined. Various organs were not commented upon. The uh, entire description was quite meager. All right. When you were called upon as a part of the committee that Mr. Dr. Petty was involved with to make your determinations, was the necessary evidence presented to you by the government for you to do that? For example, was the brain there? No. That's the, the do you brain. need the brain? Yes, the head wounds, you would need the brain. Why? Because, as you would have to use 
your eyes and uh, other um, measuring devices for determination of bullet wound characteristics in different parts of the body, so would it be the same with regard to the brain? In this case, even more so, because the brain was not examined at the time of the autopsy. It was fixed in formalin, which was a proper thing to do. But two weeks later, on December 6th, in the supplemental examination, they did not then section the brain in stepwise fashion to examine it. They said that in order to preserve the specimen, they were not going to do that. So and the brain was never examined in this case. The, so they told you it was put in formalin? That's what they said in they their They said report. it was preserved? Yes. And then when you asked for it, were you provided the brain? No, uh, the brain is not available. Uh, did you look for the brain? Oh, I had looked for it many times in many ways before, and the panel again uh, had asked about it. It uh, was not available. Do you, um, do you have an opinion uh, as to what occurred in the Zabruder film when the president is, is larched back? You, are, are we permitted to believe what we see there? Well, <clears throat> it'll be up to uh, the court and the jury. Uh, the uh, the um, film uh, Zabruder 313 shows the president being driven backward and to the left with substantial force at the moment of impact with the head wound. What do you consider that force to have been caused by? By a gunshot wound. From which direction? Well, the directionality in terms of the movement would be most consistent with a shot from the right side. Show, show the jury with your finger. If I am President Kennedy and I am moving down Elm Street, and I'm shot in the head <clears throat> with a high-speed velocity long gun, and I go backward and to the left like this, that is most consistent with a force of substantial nature coming in from the right side, the jury being in that area of the right side. Would that be driving consistent? Driving me backwards. Would that be consistent with a shot coming from the grassy knoll? Yes, it would be. You may examine. Cyril, um, I respect you. You know, you've got a pretty good background, don't you? Spent a lot of years in school. But you're, you're known as, as the darling of the conspiracy buffs in this country, oh, aren't please. you? please, that's, that's oh, wait, wait, wait. You, you asked him to give a summation to the jury, and I can't ask him if he's a darling? Please, please. I asked him for his testimony, Your Honor, and I think that that's demeaning of a witness well, of this character. Ask him if he's a member of a particular committee. Sustain as to the darling Doctor, part. even though from a professional perspective, you don't think too much of the autopsy surgeons, you do agree 100% with their findings, to wit that the bullet wound to the president's upper right back and the bullet wound to the back of the president's head were both entry wounds, not exit wounds, and hence the bullets were fired from the rear. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, let's go on to the next question now. No final summation. I'm going to be doing that. Was it just accidental on their part that they came to the same identical conclusion you came to? That's not the same identical conclusion. Okay. That's just a part. Dr. Wecht, in a 1974 article, 1974 article for Forensic Science, page 128. Did you say this? So far as the available medical evidence shows, all shots were fired from the rear. No support can be found for theories which postulate gunmen to the front or right front of the presidential car. Did you write those words, doctor? Yes, exactly. Okay. Available medical evidence. All That's right. the phrase, right. Mr. Bugliosi. Available medical evidence. He'll have some opportunity on redirect. Just answer my questions. You know, I think he is, and I, I, I don't think he's being fair with this witness, Your Honor. Somehow, so you... when he gives an answer that he doesn't like, then he admonishes the witness and scolds him. And I think a witness ought to be able to answer without being scolded Dr. by Mr. Overruled. I think Dr. Wecht's handling himself all right. I think sir. he's doing all right, too. Thank you. As far as the brain, doctor, uh, you're well aware, are you not, that after interviewing or taking depositions from over 30 people close to the matter, the House Select Committee that you were on, the investigators concluded that the president's brother, Robert Kennedy, who had told people he feared his brother's brain might conceivably 
be placed on public display years from now. They came to the conclusion that it was he who was responsible for the disappearance of his brother's brain. You're aware of that. That's the conclusion of the House Select Committee investigators. They suggested it. Okay. But I take it you don't accept this possibility. You oh, smell I, I have no way of knowing. Well, you kind of smell a rat here, don't you? I have no way of knowing. All right. Let's go on. The head snapped to the rear, doctor. I believe you testified that that bullet could have come from the front. Is that correct? That's right. Okay. Well, right, right side I prefer, Mr. Bullio. You prefer? Right side. Yeah, but that's not Mr. He's not happy oh, with that. Oh, no, he did. I, he did say right side, and I yeah. said right side, and he said grassy knoll, and I said yes. That's yeah. the right side. But you want him to go home happy, don't you? Oh, please. And he's that's, talking about the I grassy knoll. I have no knoll. relationship oh. to Mr. Okay. Spence. That's so bad. Julie will disregard that. So awful perfect. bad. Okay, but the grassy knoll is to the right front. Somewhat to the front, more to the side. Okay. Well, doctor, since you agree that there's no medical evidence of a bullet striking President Kennedy from the front or right front, no medical evidence, to what do you attribute the head snap to the rear, then? There's no I, said, I said, as you asked me before, Mr. Bugliosi, that the medical evidence available, I'll repeat for you, sir, that the left side of the brain was never opened, was never sectioned. So we don't know what was there the great majority of the metal fragments inside the brain were never tested. Indeed, the large piece that was embedded in the bone in the back and a fairly substantial piece embedded toward the frontal part of the skull, those two were not removed and were not tested. So we don't know a lot of things about what would happen, what happened because of the incompleteness okay. of the examination and the unavailability now, of the evidence. Do you believe that the two bullets that struck President Kennedy from behind were not fired from the southeasternmost window of the sixth floor, but from a lower floor? My own analysis, as set forth in an article published, I think, in 1974, indicated that if the shots uh, came from behind, and I believe that they had, that at least one of the shots would have been more likely to have come from around the second floor of the Texas School Book Depository Building and more down toward the other end of the building. That was my own analysis. All right. Uh, taking a look at this chart right here, Cyril. Uh, Your Honor, d just, I don't mean to be picky, but somehow it seems to me that during the course of this trial, we have always tried to show respect for people, and wouldn't it be proper for yes. doctors to be called I'm doctors? Addressing Dr. Oh, West. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Doctor. All right. Now, Doctor, if the bullet was coming on a downward path as it entered the presidential limousine, as you say it was, is that correct? Yes. All right. And it missed Governor Connolly. Is that correct? Yes. Why didn't it hit the driver of the car or do any damage to the car, Doctor? A couple of things. The straight line in that open limousine could have taken it out over the left side of the car. No. And, and as the line shows, it would have and could have indeed missed the driver. Secondly, no, wait, I didn't. It's coming on a downward path, Ciro. I mean, Maybe. doctor, doctor, I'm sorry. It's coming on a downward path into the presidential limousine, goes through the president's body, misses Governor Connolly, and ma magically also misses the driver and doesn't do any damage to the presidential Wait, limousine. Wait, just a moment. I did not say that that bullet missed all of these people completely or that it missed the car. Well, whom did you it know that there were fragments found in the car, Mr. Bugliosi. You said the bullet passed on a straight line through the president's body. Absolutely. Passed through soft tissue. That's so right. So that bullet came out pristine. That's right. The bullet fragments found in the front seat of this car, doctor, were bullet fragments, very, very damaged, very, very small. What yes. happened to that pristine bullet when it came through President Kennedy's body? What Who happened? Hit? What happened to the third bullet under the Warren Commission theory, Mr. Bugliosi? Yeah. Where is it? You're asking me to be responsible no. for the bullets I in this know case? What happened to your bullet, I'm doctor. asking you what happened to the third bullet yes. under the Warren Commission report. Yeah, please, you don't want to doctor, my question. Doctor, no, please. I don't have. Yeah. I, I can't tell you where all the bullets well, are. Doctor, I didn't conduct the investigation. Yeah, the prosecution has its own magic bullet. Okay, Mr. Bugliosi, now, please. Dr. Weck, I'm going to ask you, please. I, I know that we've got some time constraints, but both of you sure like to talk at the same time, and Mrs. Zahn is still working for the court, Doctor. and she can't take you both. So let's just slow it down just a little. Okay? Dr. Weck, right. Right. you've suggested, Doctor, that maybe the bullets that entered um, from the right front, if there were any bullets from the right front, were synchronized, right? That at the very moment that the bullet was fired from the rear, someone else may have fired from the... Uh, the side or the uh, right front, is that correct? Yes. 
A, a bullet, sir. Yeah, a now, bullet. how would the synchronization have taken place, doctor? Oh, that's very simple. Was someone looking at a stopwatch with a rifle you and can, also looking through the crosshairs? You can crosshairs? do it according to a point in time. You can do it from a prearranged signal. You can do it with a stopwatch. So they would be looking at the stopwatch and holding the rifle and at the same time looking through their sights. Is that correct? In whatever way it's done, I haven't uh, done much shooting like that Have recently. Have you thought about it, doctor? Yes, I've thought about it. Because... Not a problem. Okay, because... Not a problem with the right kind okay. of watch okay. and shooting with a good weapon. Not a problem. Because it would have had to have hit within one-eighteenth of a second. Is that correct? Of yes. Simul... You agree with that? I agree. Well, yes. not necessarily with one-eighteenth, but I agree within a, a fraction and a small fraction of a second. Yes, it's I do extremely, agree. Extremely, extremely remote. Isn't that right, doctor? I would say that it is a remote possibility, but a physical possibility to be considered. Okay. Well, doctor, by definition, it seems to me that you are saying that if the other eight pathologists disagreed with you, and they did, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Seems to me, doctor, that by necessary implication, they are either hopelessly and utterly incompetent or they deliberately suppress the truth from the American public. Is that correct? There is a third alternative, which would be a hybrid to some extent of the deliberate suppression, sir, to some extent a subconscious desire not to um, injure or aggrieve the government from whom they look for various research grants cool. and appointments and lectureships at the Armed Forces okay. Institute of Pathology and a who are variety some, of other... Who are areas. some of these other doctors? Aren't they doctors of good reputation and standing in the medical community? You bring them here, sir, okay. and present them to the jury. I can only present my testimony, show the pictures okay. for his honor and the jury. You bring the other eight in and let them okay. present their so views. So of the nine pathologists, Dr. Weck, you're the only one that had the honor and the integrity and the professional responsibility to tell the truth to the American people. Is that correct, doctor? I'll prefer to put okay, it this way. I'm no the only question. one no who question. had the no further courage questions. to say that the king was nude and had no clothes okay. on. Yes. No further That's questions. Correct. All right, to redirect. Thank you. Just a couple of questions, Dr. Wecht. Are you... You've been asked by Mr. Bugliosi to try to explain what happened to the magic bullet as it was fired into the president's limousine. Do you even believe that the magic bullet was fired into the president's limousine? I have much doubts about where and when that bullet was fired, how it was found at Parkland Hospital, and uh, how it may relate to other individuals who played a key role in this case who were seen at Parkland Hospital that afternoon. Are you aware of the fact that Mr. Ruby Jack Ruby was at the Parkland Hospital that afternoon? Yes, I have Mr. Ruby very much in mind. And do you think that that uh, bullet 399 is a true and genuine bullet that was fired at the time the president was murdered? Or do you think in, in reasonable medical probability, based on reasonable medical probability, that it's a fake and a fraud? I have much doubt as to whether that bullet went through any of the individuals that day. If it did, it would be consistent only with a bullet having gone through the president's neck. It would not be consistent, for the reasons I've given, with a bullet that would have destroyed four to five inches of the governor's rib and caused a comminuted fracture of the governor's wrist. No further questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Wick. Call your next witness. Call Paul O'Connor, please. Mr. O'Connor? Have you been sworn, Mr. O'Connor? Yes, sir, I have. Fine, thank you. If you would, please. <clears throat> Mr. O'Connor, tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury who you are. My name is Paul K. O'Connor. I was from Gainesville, Florida. Would you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what you were doing when you were 21 years old? Yes. What were you doing? I was a hospital corpsman, United States Navy, and I was stationed in Bethesda, Maryland. At Bethesda Hospital, where the president was brought? Yes, sir. Were you present when they brought the president in? Yes, sir. And would you tell uh, the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what your duties were at Bethesda Hospital at that time? Well, I worked with a partner. Uh, we assisted in postmortem. My job in postmortem was to remove the, the a deceased brain. Are you just a little bit nervous? A little bit. Well, I don't blame you. 
It's all right. Just take your time. If he was that close to me, I'd be a little worried, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'll back off. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> just, just, we're, we're all in this together, so just try understand. Just take your time. Speak up just a little bit, if you would, please, Mr. O'Connor. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, as I said before, my job was to remove uh, the de a deceased person's brain and prepare it for... Uh, Putting, putting in a formalin so it was fixed so that the uh, pathologist could examine it at a later date. And uh, did you prepare to do that in, uh, in the president's case? Yes, sir, I did. Did you see uh, who was in charge of the uh, autopsy there? Uh, Commander Boswell, Commander Humes. Was, uh, who, who was actually had his hands on the, on the president doing the autopsy? Dr. Humes did. Who else was there in that autopsy room? Describe the scene just so the jury can see it in their own eyes. Well, you have to imagine what the autopsy room looked like. It was quite large, had an amphitheater. It was used for teaching, All right. pathology. The room was filled full of Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, high-ranking officers, uh, civilians. Of, it was jam-packed. Right. Did you, uh, what, what was the attitudes of the, of the people? Uh, was it calm? No. Yeah. What was it? It was very hysterical. Uh, were, were, was Dr. Hume receiving any interference in what he was doing? We were interfered with constantly, yes. And who was interfering with what was going on? Well, there was Admiral Berkeley, the president's physician at the time. What was he doing? He just interfered constantly. Uh, he, he would, we'd go to do a procedure and he'd say, no, don't, let's don't do that, let's do something else, or the Kennedy family, family wouldn't like that, or... It was on and on like that all the time. Now, when the president came in, uh, what did you do? The casket came in approximately 8 o'clock in the evening. They set the casket on the floor beside the table, and we opened the casket. Inside was a body bag. The body bag was unzipped and removed the president's body and placed it on the table. Did you help do that? Yes. Did you have your hands on him? Yes. At what point, part of, the, of his body, sir? Uh, his shoulders. All right. You were at the head end? Yes. Well, now let's just describe to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what you were prepared to do. What were you prepared to do? Prepare the body, remove the brain. And you were prepared to remove the brain? Yes. And would you tell the jury how that's done, please? In order to remove a brain from a deceased person, you have to make an incision. It goes from ear, across the top of the head to ear. Then the scalp is slowly peeled back until it's hooked under the chin on the front. The scalp is retracted in the back the same way. You then cut the temporal muscles on both sides. You have two sets of muscles on both sides called temporal muscles. They're, they're cut. Then I used a saw and sawed completely around the top of the cranium. And then what, sir? You take a small uh, chisel and you pry the cranium loose and open up the top of the skull where you have the dura mater, which is a tough, fibrous membrane that covers the brain. That's then cut with a pair of scissors all the way around close to where you've done the cutting with a saw. That exposes the whole top of the brain. At that time, you reach in very gently with your, with your left hand, and you pull up the front of the brain and cut the optic nerves and other nerves and veins and arteries that hold and support the cranium, I mean, the brain in the cranium. All right, now, Mr. O'Connor, in this case, we have developed some facts that when these doctors who testified here came before this jury to testify, there was no, they were never shown a brain. Although they were told there had been a brain placed in a, for, a bucket of formaldehyde, but they never were shown the brain. Do you have an explanation for that? Yes, I do. Would you tell the jury what the explanation is? The president's brains were literally blown out of his head. He had none. Are you saying that there was no brain in the present? There was head? no brain. There were pieces of brain matter that were inside the cranium, just macerated pieces. Nothing that you could tell one part from the other. 
Well, uh, what do you mean there were pieces? How much of the how much of the brain was left in the skull? Maybe a handful, at the most. You mean a full handful or what? Maybe a half a handful. Now, did you open the president's brain as you would in an ordinary case? We didn't have to. You mean you, you didn't peel the president's brain back? Mm, no, sir. No, no, no. We, there was nothing to do. He had a monstrous hole in his head. And so there was never a cut around or the hole or the brain taken out? We didn't have to. Because the brain wasn't there? The brain was gone for all practical purposes. It was gone. Well, when doctor, when these people draw pictures of the brain, when these people say that there were pictures taken, photographs taken of the brain, what do you have to say about that? They must be talking about somebody else. Well, were you at the f head of the president all during the time the autopsy the was taken? The whole time. When people say that the brain was put in, fixed in per formaldehyde, is that true? No. Is that a lie, sir? It has to be. There's no brain. Thank you, sir. You may examine. <clears throat> Mr. O'Connor, you were 21 at the time, sir? The time of the About incident? 21 or 22. Okay. I'm not really sure right now, sir. I have no, no doubt, Mr. O'Connor, that in a normal situation, it would be you who would remove the brain from the uh, decedent. But this obviously and unquestionably was not a normal situation. You certainly agree with me on that? Mm, yes, sir. Okay. Is it possible, then, that that the autopsy surgeons would have done this, as opposed to you, in this situation, since it was so unusual? Well, they did most of the mundane jobs that we did that night. Okay. But they did not remove the brain from the body? There was no brain to be removed. The official autopsy report in this case, Mr. O'Connor, dated November the 22nd, 1963, states on page 4, the brain is removed and preserved for further study following formal, formalin fixation. Also, from the surface of the disrupted right cerebral cortex, two small irregularly shaped fragments of metal are recovered. These measure 7 by 2 millimeters and 3 by 1 millimeter. These are placed in the custody of agents Francis X. O'Neill, Jr. and James W. Siebert of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, who executed a receipt therefore. Now, Mr. O'Connor, three surgeons signed their name to this autopsy report. Are you saying that none of these things happened? Not to my knowledge, they didn't. Okay. <clears throat> now, would you agree, uh, Mr. O'Connor, that the president arriving at Bethesda Hospital with his brain already having been removed is one of the most shocking things that you've ever seen in your whole life? Not the most, but one of the most. Okay, certainly one of the most. Yes. And it goes without saying that you felt this is something that should have been investigated, right? Well, I figured it would be. Okay. In fact, throughout the years, you've often wondered what the answer to, the, to it was, right? Oh, I still have okay. questions. Now, in 1978, you were interviewed by the House Select Committee on Assassinations. Is that correct? That's correct. And this was a one-and-a-half-hour interview? Yes, sir, as I can remember. They're pretty much in-depth, right? Yes, sir. They wanted to know about your observations that night, right? That's right. They want to talk to everyone who had anything to do with this matter. That's correct. Okay. Now, Mr. O'Connor, if the president's brain being missing <coughs> from his head is one of the most shocking things that you've ever seen in your entire life, a matter that you think should have been investigated, certainly, and if they spoke to you for one and a half hours, about your observations that night, why wasn't it important enough for you to tell these people about it? I was under orders not to talk until that time. What? I was under orders not to talk to anybody. By whom? By uh, the United States military brought in orders a couple of days after the autopsy, and we were to remain, remain silent. But you talked to them for an hour and a half. You told them all types of things in that document. I got received permission from the Select Committee on Assassinations to talk through the Secretary of Navy and Secretary of Defense. Paul, when I first asked you this question over the phone, did you tell me the reason I never told them is they never asked me? Well, they didn't ask me. And that's why you didn't tell them? Yes. So in other words, 
Mr. O'Connor, even though this is one of the most shocking things that you've ever seen, and you're, you're going to remember it to the day you die, and you feel this matter should have been investigated, if those investigators from the House Select Committee didn't ask you the magic question, by golly, you're not about to tell them it. Is that correct? No, sir. I only asked what, uh, <clears throat> answer what I was t asked, and that was it. I, I see. Elaborate. Thank you. No further questions. Fine. Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. You may step down. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you very much. Call your next witness. Next witness I'm calling as an adverse witness. James Hoster, please. Right. Mr. Hoster, have you been sworn? Yes, sir. Fine. Thank you. If you would, please, sir, if you just come up here and have a seat. That's Hosty. Hosty, thank you. I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Mr. Right, Hosty, thank you. They My call fault. me Burton a lot, so we'll get, we'll okay. get along fine. Thank you. Okay. You're a former FBI agent? I'm a retired agent. That is correct. Were you um, a retired, were you at the FBI, uh, working for the FBI um, in Dallas in uh, 1963? When I was. When our president was assassinated? I was. Now, you received a note in uh, November 1963 mm -hmm. from Mr. Oswald, didn't you? Indirectly, yes. After the president's assassination, but before the Warren Commission met, you were told by the FBI to destroy that note, weren't you? After Oswald was killed, and 10 days to two weeks before the Warren Commission was even announced, I was ordered to destroy it, yes. And who told you to destroy that note? I was told by the agent in charge, Gordon Shanklin. He handed it to me. He said, here, I don't ever want to see this again. And as a result of that, what did you do? I got rid of it. I destroyed it. Now. You had some other memorandums, too, didn't you, that were destroyed? The memorandum was explaining how I came into possession of the note. And isn't it true, Mr. Uh, Posty, that you were told by your superior, Mr. Shanklin, to get it out of here, quote, get it out of here, I don't even want it in this office, get rid of it? That's correct. And as a result of what he told you, did you get it out of there and get rid of the note? That is correct. Do you, does the FBI generally destroy evidence? That was an evidence because uh, Please, with just Oswald my dead. my question, does the FBI generally destroy evidence? After the trial is over with, yes, we do. Thank you. I want to ask you something about... Um, about a particular trip that Mr. Um, Oswald was supposedly, that Lee supposedly made to, to Mexico. There was some information that was withheld from you, isn't that true? Yes, sir. And the information that you believe that was withheld from you had to do with the supposed trip of Lee to Mexico where he supposedly appeared at the Cuban embassy as well as the Russian embassy. Isn't that true? That's correct. And isn't it also true that the information that was held from you is that Lee supposedly talked to the Russian, to a Russian to the leader of, uh, to the head of the Russian intelligence in, in that hemisphere, a man by the name of Valery Vladimirovich Kostikov, and that Mr. Kostikov was in charge for the KGB of assassinations. You found that out later, didn't you? About three years later, and you found out that that information, supposing Lee's trip to Mexico, was withheld by the FBI from you. Isn't that true? It was not furnished to me at any time, no. That angered you, didn't it, sir? Yes, sir, very much so. You didn't feel that the FBI should be withholding information from its agents? I didn't think so, no, sir. Now, 
You've always been a trusted agent? Yes, sir. I retired as one. Mr. Uh, Hostie, have you ever seen this? Subject, Lee Henry Oswald. On October 1st, 1963, a reliable and sensitive source in Mexico reported that an American male who identified himself as Lee Oswald contacted the Soviet embassy in Mexico City inquiring whether the embassy had received any new uh, news concerning a telegram which had been sent to Washington. The American was described as approximately 35 years old with an athletic build about six feet tall with a receding hairline. Are you aware of that cable? No, sir, that's not the one I saw. That's the one of October the 10th, isn't it? This is the October 10th cable. Now, you did go to visit in the course of your duties as a loyal officer of the FBI. You did go to uh, the residence of Mr. Oswald to talk to Mr. Oswald prior to the assassination. Isn't that true? It's that's not true. Well, you, went to, you did talk to Mrs. Oswald. Correct. November the 1st. And after the assassination, do you, do you know whether or not a notebook uh, of uh, Lee Oswald's was discovered? Yes, sir. I personally found it among his effects. And uh, was your name in it? The name of James P. Hasty, H-A-S-T-Y, was found in it. All right. You, where he, even he was having trouble. He had trouble. That's why we call it Hosty. All right. <laughs> And so, and so, uh, Mr. Hosty, um, your name, address, license, at least license plate number? Uh, with their license plate number was incorrect, but it was very close. It was one digit off. And your telephone number? The office number, right. We're all in Lee's notebook. That's correct. Now, when this notebook was presented by the FBI, <clears throat> to the Warren Commission, that page was deleted, wasn't it? Not that page, no, sir, just the one uh, item, the one uh, reference. It wasn't, a, my name didn't take up a whole page, it was part of a page. So they took that out, didn't they? It was left out. Now, are you aware of a conversation with Walter Jenkins, presidential aide, and J. Edgar Hoover, immediately following the assassination in which Hoover said, quote, the thing I am concerned about, and so is Mr. Katzenbaugh, is having something issued so we can convince the public that Oswald is the real assassin. Were you aware of that? Well, I have read of this, yes. Thank you. I believe you told me that your investigation of Oswald revealed he was far too unstable for any professional intelligence agency to have used him in any way. Is that correct? That would be true. All right. Now, about the tearing up of the note from Oswald, I believe you told me that when... We spoke over the phone that you were ordered to do it because your superiors were afraid that J. Edgar Hoover, you were afraid of his wrath. He was a tough, tough little cookie. I learned that just recently, okay. yes, sir. You were afraid, they were afraid that if Hoover found out that Oswald had threatened an FBI agent and the Secret Service was not notified of this before President Kennedy came to Dallas, Hoover would explode. Is that correct? Yeah. The letter did not threaten me. There was no threat in the letter. No, wait no, a while, sir. wait a while. But I'm saying that the reason you were ordered to destroy the letter is your superiors felt that if Hoover found out about it, he would be extremely upset. If he found out about the fact that we'd had any contact with him prior to the assassination, he, uh, they didn't want that even out, right? No, wait a while now, Mr. Hoover. There was no threat involved. Well, Mrs. Fenner, the FBI receptionist, recalls the note as reading that Oswald would blow up the offices of the FBI and Dallas Police Department if you didn't stop bothering his wife. She's given three different versions. Okay. Which one do you want? Well, that's one of them. Is that correct? That's my understanding. Okay. So basically, you and your superiors, uh, I think you told me this, everyone was trying to avoid being blamed for not having prevented the assassination. Isn't that correct? That could be, yes. Okay, let's go on. Concerning your name and address being removed from Oswald's address book, what, if anything, did you find out about that? I found out that one of the agents from the New Orleans office had left it out. He thought he was doing me a favor. Okay. He had not consulted with me, and I was not aware of it. Clearly improper on his part. Definitely. Okay. About this fellow Kostikov. You say he was a member of an assassination union. Is that correct? He was the Western Hemisphere chief 
of line V as in Victor, which is the section having to do with assassination, sabotage, and kidnapping. You told me, did you not, that you don't believe Kostikov knew who Lee Harvey Oswald was when Oswald came to the Soviet embassy? That is my understanding. Well, please. The evidence is that Lee Harvey Oswald wasn't even there. Okay. You say you received a Please. cable. Just been watch. The objection is he assumes a fact that this jury has to decide. The evidence before the jury is that there was an imposter there. He, he claims that there was a conversation between these two. I don't think that's proper for him to do that. Well, we're giving the other side, uh, no matter how thin they make the pancakes, you know, there's always two sides, and he's that's his side. Jury recall what the evidence was. All right. In fact, Ruth Payne gave you a handwritten letter she had found of Oswald's, which he subsequently typed up and sent on November the 9th to the Russian embassy in Washington. Is that not true? That's correct. Mr. And in Jibber. it, he refers to his being in Mexico City to get a visa. Is that correct? Yes, sir. You're certainly not suggesting to this jury that Kostikov, who at one time may or may not have been a member of any assassination unit, you're not suggesting that he, did, that he had anything to do with the assassination. Is that correct? There's no evidence to that effect. Would you tell the jury what your investigation revealed as to how this confusion came about, describing Oswald as 35 and receding hairline? They had a wiretap intercept on October 1st in which he stated that uh, he, he wanted to come over to the Russian embassy to pick up his visa. Therefore, they had every reason to believe that a person named Lee Oswald was on his way to the Soviet embassy to pick up a visa. Uh, this individual then came out of the embassy a short time later, obviously stuffing something into a wallet, and they thought that this probably was the person that they heard. Okay, in other words, the CIA had um, a telephonic conversation of a man named Lee Harvey Oswald going Lee to Oswald. the Russian embassy. Mm -hmm. So they had his name, mm -hmm. but they did not have his description. description. Yeah. That, that is what I, uh, I'm, I'm uh, okay. uh, told is correct, that they jumped to the wrong conclusion. They okay. saw the person coming out after the phone conversation, put the two together incorrectly. You told me when we spoke that you felt that the FBI had made you the fall guy in the assassination. Is that correct? Absolutely. Mr. Hosty, the charge has been made. I'm not saying it's valid, that Oswald was a dangerous enough person for you to have alerted the Secret Service about Oswald before President Kennedy came to Dallas. The only thing that we could tell the Secret Service was a direct threat to the President. He made no direct threat to the President, therefore we could not tell them. Thank you. Mr. Hosty, you may step down. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Hosty. Mr. Spence, call your next witness. Call Mr. Lopez, please. Mr. Lopez, please. Mr. Lopez, have you been sworn? Yes, I have, sir. Fine. If you would, please, just have a seat right over here. <clears throat> Mr. Lopez, tell the folks who you are. My name is Edwin Juan Lopez. I am an attorney now and was back in 1977 and 78 one of the research investigators for the House Select Committee on Assassinations. Doing research for them? Well, we were trying to determine whether Lee Harvey Oswald had, in fact, visited the Cuban and Soviet embassies in Mexico City. Did you come to a conclusion? Yes, we did. What was your conclusion? We had no choice but to, us to conclude that he had not. Now, would you give the ladies and gentlemen of the jury uh, some facts upon which you base that conclusion, which is to say, Mr. Lopez, that there must have been an imposter there. Is that correct? That is correct. Would you explain why? Well, as part of my job on the committee was to go through all the documents that the CIA would allow us to get, have access to. And part of those documents consisted of photographs that were taken from three different sites at the Cuban embassy in Mexico City during the time that Lee Harvey Oswald had allegedly visited that embassy. After reviewing all those photos, we found no photograph of Lee Harvey Oswald, even though they had photographers there around the clock. Three photographers? They had three photographers altogether. Three photographers around the clock watching the embassies. Lee Harvey was supposed to have gone in there three times. Correct. Now, did you write a report? We wrote a report that was approximately 280 pages that was classified. And is, it class is your 280 page classified report classified today? It is still classified. Now, tell the folks of the jury whether or not you are under a secrecy oath. Yes, I am. 
And so there are many things that you know, Mr. Lopez, about this matter that you are not able to tell the jury because of your secrecy oath. Is that, that correct? That is correct. Mr. Lopez, as a, as a lawyer, you know that if Lee had lived and had been tried by a jury like, like these ladies and gentlemen, that uh, one of two things would have happened. One, Lee could have required the production of all of those secret files that you've seen. That is correct. That you've been sworn to keep secret. That is correct. Lee, in, a, in one of his uh, statements to the press, screamed out, I am a patsy. Do you believe he was a patsy? Yes, I do. And um, uh, from what you were able to see uh, of the, FI, uh, the CIA and the rest, are you able to conclude whether or not they had the capacity, the ability to fake photographs? Oh, there was no doubt. No doubt. In fact, um, we were given access to a certain file that's now public information called the ZR rifle file that was written by the chief of the Western Hemisphere. And in that file, the chief talks about assassinations of leaders and how they could then go about covering up. And he talks about fake 201 files and fake identities and exactly, I mean, how you can make a patsy out of someone. You talked about a fake 201 file. Was there a 201 file on Lee? Oh, there was a, an extensive one. All right. Now, what is business of the imposter? You say there was an imposter there, um, a man that's supposed to have been 35 years old with an athletic build about six feet tall. Did the CIA tell anybody that this was supposed to be a friend of Lee's? Or was this supposed to be Lee? Back in 63, they just said it was Lee. In 63? In October of 63? They just said that was supposed to be Lee Harvey Oswald. A month before the president was killed. Is that correct? That's correct. Do you know why somebody would be down in Mexico City a month before the president's assassination posing as my client? Well, the only plausible explanation is that they were trying to set him up. Is that the conclusion that you came to? Yes, it was. You may examine. Will she? Mr. Lopez, uh, do you believe that Lee Harvey Oswald was associated with the CIA in any way? Oh, I, I have no doubt that he was in some way, yes. OK. Do you believe that the CIA may have set Lee Harvey Oswald up? Not as an agency, no. OK. but. Maverick elements, rogue? Some type of maverick element, okay, yes. Okay, and you believe that the CIA covered up for these rogue elephants? That's their modus operandi. Okay. Can you give us one tiny scrap of evidence? I certainly can't, sir, because I'm you under can't. secrecy oath. So. Okay, now, do you or do you not believe that Lee Harvey Oswald was at the Cuban consulate on September the 27th, 1963, or at any time in September, October of 63? I don't believe it, no. Okay. You're aware of Sylvia Duran? Oh, certainly. I question her. Okay. You're aware of her testimony in front of the House Select Committee that she typed up the Cuban visa application for, for Oswald. That's correct. Can we see that on the screen. I think it's 172. Exhibit 172. Now, she testified she typed that up, and uh, a handwriting fellow said that Oswald's signature is on there, but that doesn't convince you that it, that it was Oswald at the Cuban consulate in Mexico City on September the 27th. Is that she, correct? Well, she could never tell us that he had signed it in her presence. We talked to her for hours. She could never describe him correctly to us, his height, the color of his hair. Um, I mean, none of the descriptions matched. Okay. We had other okay. testimony from people in the embassy that said that it was not But Oswald the House Select also. Committee con concluded that Duran was identifying Oswald. Is that not so? Sir, I couldn't at all, all vouch right. for all the work that they did, unfortunately. You're aware that Sylvia Duran testified in front of the House Select Committee that she gave Oswald her name on a piece of paper with the Cuban consulate phone number on it, 11-28-47. You're aware of that? At least that she gave someone okay. who said they were Oswald. Are you aware of this phone number surfacing again in a way that supports the conclusion that it, in fact, was Oswald? I think you'll have to refresh my recollection. Okay. Off the top of your head, you're not aware of it. Is that correct? I just don't remember. Let's it look now. at Exhibit 245. 
Presently on the screen, Mr. Lopez, is a page from Oswald's address book found at his residence after his arrest. And lo and behold, we see Sylvia Duran's name and the phone number 11-28-47. Were you aware of this, Mr. Lopez? Now that I see it, yes, I but was. But that doesn't satisfy you either. Is that correct? No, sir. Can you tell the jury then whether you think Oswald was in Mexico City at all in late September of 63? Oh, I think he was, yes. Is it possible that he was trying to get to Cuba? Sir, based on the information that we had, I would venture to say that it's not possible. You certainly don't suspect the Secret Service of being involved in the assassination, do you? No. But if no. there was a conspiracy to set up Oswald, it would have been hatched a long time ago, months earlier. Is that correct? <laughs> Certainly. Okay. Are you aware, Mr. Lopez, that the motorcade route which took the president past the book depository building was decided upon by Secret Service agents Lawson and Sorrells on November the 14th, 1963, just nine days before the assassination, and it wasn't furnished to the Dallas Police Department until November the 18th, just five days before the assassination? Were you aware of that? Certainly. So these conspirators then, way back a couple months earlier, when they were hatching this conspiracy to frame Oswald, how extraordinarily lucky they were that a couple months later, the President of the United States happens to go to Dallas and drive slowly by Oswald's sixth floor window with the top of the car down. Extraordinarily lucky, isn't that right, sir? I wouldn't call it lucky. I mean, what? there's always contact, sir. Yeah, but don't you think... As a person who worked with the agency for a okay. year and a half, okay. I can tell you that they have contacts in every okay. agency. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Lopez, okay. thank you very much. Thank you, you may step sir. down. Call your next witness. Call Seth Cantor, please. Mr. Cantor, if you would, please come forward. Have you been sworn in as a witness? I have not, sir. All right, if you would, please come forward and raise your right hand. <clears throat> Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give in the proceedings before this court will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Fine. Please take a seat. Cantor, please, just God. have a seat right there, please. <clears throat> Cantor, would you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury who you are? My name is Seth Cantor. I live in Washington, D.C. What do you do? I'm a newspaper reporter. And uh, what were you doing on the day the president was murdered? I had accompanied the president from Washington, D.C. on the press plane uh, to Texas. And uh, in Dallas, I was in the motorcade as it, as it came into Dealey Plaza. Later, were you present... Uh... Uh, when Lee Harvey Oswald, my client, was arrested and taken into custody. I was at uh, Parkland Hospital and uh, went out to Love Field where the new president was sworn in. And then I rode downtown to the police station. And when I got there, they had arrested Lee Harvey Oswald. Describe the scene at the Parkland Hospital in Dallas for the ju jury, please. Well, I arrived at uh, Parkland Hospital just very shortly after the president was brought in, and I saw the car that the president and um, his wife and the Connollys had been riding in. Uh, a door was open, there was blood on the ground, there was a bouquet of crushed roses in the back seat of the <clears throat> car. You'd have wanted to plant bullet particles in there, could you have done so? If I'd wanted to, yes. Could anybody? I believe so. Did you later see somebody there that became noted or notorious in the saga of the assassination of our president? Well, are you referring to Jack Ruby? Yes. Yes, I did not see Jack Ruby in that immediate area of the emergency room. I saw Jack Ruby and spoke with him and shook hands with him. Uh, some distance away in the hospital as I was on my way to uh, the press conference, an emergency press conference. How did you happen to know Jack Ruby? I had been a reporter in Dallas previous to moving to Washington. I was on the Dallas Times Herald, frequently wrote uh, feature stories, uh, came across various characters uh, in town, and uh, Jack Ruby was one of those. And Jack Ruby was the kind of person who hung around uh, newspaper city rooms and uh, hung around with the police. And uh, he was 
in full evidence, usually at sporting events, boxing matches, football games, things like that. You know. And he was there where the president was, where the president's body was. He was in Parkland Hospital, yes. Sir. And it was in the Parkland Hospital, was it not, Mr. Cantor, in which the stretcher, uh, both Conley and, uh, and the president uh, were left? Yes, sir. And it was in this, on this stretcher purportedly of Governor Conley that the magic bullet was found. Is that correct? That is correct. Do you believe that had, just assuming that had Jack Ruby wished to drop the magic bullet there, that he would have had an opportunity to do so? I, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't say. I just don't know. I, mean, I don't he know. He was in the hospital. Yes, he was definitely in the hospital. Thank you. Were you around when uh, uh, Jack Ruby shot my client? Yes, I was. Do we have the clip of the killing of Lee? I'd like the jury to see that, please. There is Lee Oswald. He's been shot. He's been shot. Lee Oswald has been shot. There's a man with a gun. It's absolute panic. Absolute panic here in the basement of Dallas Police Headquarters. Now, did you make some inquiry into the background of Jack Ruby? I hadn't intended to make uh, <clears throat> inquiry into his background uh, in the years that I lived in Dallas, but I knew somewhat something about his background then, and then eventually I made a concerted effort to look into it. And was that in connection with the writing of a book that you, that you did? It was. Did you get some information by suing the United States government under the Freedom of Information Act in order to write your book, sir? Yes, I did. And as what was part of the information that you got as a result of that lawsuit, the telephone records of Jack Ruby? Yes. Could you give me 254, please? Now, this is a chart, sir, as you know. What does, would you explain it to the jury? Would you just step down here very quickly and explain it to the jury? Well, this is a chart showing uh, Jack Ruby's toll calls from both his home and uh, his place of business, a striptease club in downtown Dallas, uh, to, uh, to various people. In particular, it shows uh, during the months of September through November uh, an upsurge in, uh, in Jack Ruby's uh, phone calls. And did you find out to who those calls were made? Well, they included calls to people like uh, Barney Baker, who was a, a lieutenant of uh, Jimmy Hoffa, and a, uh, he weighed about 300 pounds, and he had a reputation for being quite a, a muscle man. Um, How about Nafio Picora? Nafio Picora, uh, also a member of the underworld, was included, and so was David Yaris. And, uh, Mr. Kanner? You can sit I mean, down through with Thank, you. Thank you. I'll have to see it. Let me see. Yes, right here. It's not a it's Picora, Lieutenant Four mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's right. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and how about Lewis McWillie? Lewis McWillie, he called in Las Vegas and uh, was a well-known uh, police character in Dallas. How about Lenny Patrick? Lenny Patrick, a Chicago hoodlum like David Yaris. And do you know whether or not uh, Lenny Patrick wasn't a mafia ex ex executioner? Yes, that was his reputation. Well, all right. Um, do you know uh, whether or not Mr. Ruby went to Cuba prior to the, ex the, the, to the assassination of President Kennedy? Uh, Jack Ruby made known trips to Cuba in the fall of 1959. And do you know who he saw there? According to information uh, furnished uh, by the CIA, ultimately, uh, I went to a jail cell to visit um, a well-known mafia leader in the United States named Santo Traficanti. Was Santo Traficanti known as one involved in organizing the assassination squads with the CIA? That's, that's my understanding, yes, sir. The CIA had made a number of attempts on the life of Castro, had it not? That's correct. Now, 
were you present when, when, when Mr. Uh, uh, Oswald uh, was brought out, was hauled through at the press conference uh, and, and made some statements about, about wanting help? I was. Would you produce that clip, please, for us at this time? The question by Judge Hargoire protested at that time that I was not allowed legal representation uh, during that uh, that uh, very short and sweet hearing. Uh, I really don't know what what the situation is about. Nobody has told me anything except that I'm accused of uh, of uh, murdering a policeman. I know nothing more than that, and I do request. Uh, someone to come forward uh, to give me uh, a legal assistance. Now, were you present uh, when Lee told the world as he was being hauled down the hall that he was a patsy? I was. May we have the clip of that, please? It not allowed me to, to have any. I, uh, back, I don't know what this is all about. I killed the president. Back up, man. President. Come on, man. President. No, they're taking me in because of the fact that I live in the Soviet Union. Thank you. As a, a result of your investigation, did you discover whether or not Jack Ruby had in fact been an informant for the FBI? Yes, he had been. And how do you know that, sir? I obtained uh, FBI records. And did, how did you obtain those records? Through the uh, Freedom of Information Act, federal. What did those records reveal in that regard? That Jack Ruby had been uh, what the FBI called a, a PCI, a potential criminal informer, signed up uh, with the FBI in the fall of 1959. Are you acquainted with the request of Mr. Ruby to be taken away from Dallas and to be taken instead to Washington so that he could testify? He asked several times, yes, sir. Do you know, several. As a matter of fact, how many times? Seven times. Seven separate times to be taken to Washington? During the course of um, his interview with the Chief Justice. May we have, uh, there was a public interview at the time of the trial, was there not? Yes, there was. May we have the clip of that, please? Thank you very much, Mr. Cantor. You may examine. Mr. Cantor, Jack Ruby was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to death for his killing of Oswald. Is that correct? That is correct, and He sir. died on January the 3rd, 1967, from natural causes while in custody? That's correct. You agree, do you not, that there's absolutely no evidence that Jack Ruby and Lee Harvey Oswald knew each other? I agree to that, sir. And when you saw Ruby at Parkland Hospital, you felt it was perfectly normal, though, to see him there because he was, as you described, a goer to events and a man about town? Yes, sir. You're also aware, are you not, that at Ruby's trial, there was medical testimony that his electroencephalograms to measure the electric activity of the brain showed that he had organic brain damage? Yes, I remember that. And that this brain damage was probably traceable to psychomotor epilepsy? I do remember that. So you that. would agree, would you not, that Mr. Uh, Ruby was mentally and emotionally, he was not a well man? He, he, he might not fall within the pattern of the norm. Okay. Mr. Uh, Cantor, you will agree and you've so said that the evidence is clear that Jack Ruby had a very deep affection for President Kennedy. There's all types of evidence of that. Yes, sir. And at the hospital where you saw Jack Ruby at Parkland Hospital, he had tears in his eyes. Is that correct? 
Yes, he was obviously under emotional strain. Yes, sir. And that he later said that uh, he even felt worse than when his mother and father died? He did, yes, sir. He also had a bizarre relationship with his dogs, did he not? I, I would th say so, well, yes, sir. he had as many as ten dogs, one of uh, Sheba, one of whom he called Sheba, and Sheba was his wife, and the other nine were his children, is that correct? That is correct. And he'd take them, particularly Sheba, wherever he went, is that correct? Yes, she traveled with him constantly, in yes. In fact, Sheba waited patiently for him in his car while he went inside the police station and shot Oswald, is that correct? That is correct. Mr. Canner, you agree, do you not, that the general consensus of those like yourself who have studied Ruby is that Ruby thought he would be a hero to the world for having killed Oswald, a presidential assassin. Is that not true? I'm certain of it, yes, sir. Okay. You've testified to phone calls that Ruby made to crime figures and some meetings he had with various crime figures. Is that correct? I did. But Ruby had been associated with these crime figures for many years. Yes, he, he had been. Okay. And he had regular contact with them throughout the years. Is that not true? No, that's not entirely true. Uh, some of those calls that he made and some of the visits he received from some of those same yeah. people uh, shortly before okay. the assassination were with people who he'd been out of contact with for quite some time. Okay. Are you aware that the House Select Committee on Assassinations investigated these same phone calls that you testified to and concluded, quote, testimony to the committee supported the conclusion that Ruby's phone calls were by and large related to his labor troubles. Is that correct? Well, I, I don't, uh, I can't out and out dispute it. It's just that these people who he was telephoning uh, were well and deeply connected with the underworld. Okay. Mr. Canner, are you implying to this jury that by Ruby saying that he had something to say and he wanted to go to Washington that he was referring to a conspiracy? Are you implying that to the jury? I'm I hope that I'm implying, uh, members of the jury, that, that Jack Ruby uh, was maintaining that he had more information to reveal, yes. Okay. Now, I ask you this. How could you possibly say that, Mr. Cantor, when in the same identical testimony of Mr. Ruby before the Warren Commission, he specifically and expressly said that no one else was involved with him? So we know, Mr. Cantor, that when Jack Ruby was talking to the Chief Justice about going to Washington, he had to have been talking about something other than a conspiracy. I don't agree with that, sir. For one thing, uh, one of his early attorneys, a man named Joe Tonahill from Jasper, Texas, uh, told me that uh, uh, he was positive, and, and Mr. Tonahill was present during that interview with the Chief Justice, that he, Mr. Tonahill, was positive that, uh, that the room uh, was bugged, okay. that, that uh, Ruby's words were being carried okay. elsewhere and that okay. uh, it was not a safe place for Ruby to be so he far He didn't know as... that, but he suspected the room was bugged. All right. Well, if that's I... why he wanted to go to Washington. Okay. That's, if I... that's correct. Did he ever testify or tell anyone why he wanted to go to Washington? I'm not aware of it. Okay. You're also aware that on the morning he shot and killed Oswald, Sunday, November the 24th, 1963, Ruby got a phone call at his apartment from one of his strippers asking him to wire her some money. Is that correct? That is correct. And you believe this actually took place. Is that correct? I do believe it. And the evidence does show that Ruby left his apartment, went down to the Western Union office, and sent a money order to this girl at 1117 that morning. Is that correct? That is correct. And Ruby murdered Oswald at 1121. Is that correct? That is correct. Ruby has all, always maintained that the actual decision to do it was a spur of the moment thing when he went to the police department after he had sent the money order at the Western Union office. You're aware of that? That's what he said, yes, sir. After sending the money order at 1117, how long do you estimate it would have taken Ruby to walk to the police department and get down to the basement where he killed Oswald at 1121? Less than two minutes. Thank you very much, sir. Rick. <clears throat> You believe there was a Ruby cover-up from your investigation? Oh, I certainly do, yes, sir. Would you explain to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury why? I believe that uh, <clears throat> a lot of evidence points to the fact that Jack Ruby was led into the police station on purpose uh, that Sunday morning to, with the express purpose of killing uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. Why do you believe that? Well, I believe... Uh, for one of two reasons, either he was being used by a force that he wasn't either, even aware of, or there was a small number of uh, Dallas police officers who felt very strongly about the fact that Lee Harvey Oswald had, had killed one of their own number, and they wanted revenge. And they would not be able to obtain revenge once, once Lee Harvey Oswald was transferred to uh, uh, jurisdiction of the Dallas County.
That's your theory of the matter. That's correct. Uh, at least it's your theory that somebody, unknown to you or anybody else, made arrangements for him to get in. It took me a lot longer to get in than it took Jack Ruby that morning, that Sunday morning. And he was on the scene uh, regularly throughout the weekend, coming into and leaving the police department at will. Thank you, Mr. Cantor. You yes. may step down. Thank you. Defense rests. Defense rests. Members of the jury, the court is required at this time to prepare a charge for you, which is the law that is applicable to this particular case. We'll take our recess, come back, and at that time, we'll hear the final summations by the attorneys, and then I will give you the law that is applicable to this case. We'll stand in recess. Please rise.